Okay, you're live tonight. All right. We call to order the Planning Commission meeting, Hood River Planning Commission for Tuesday, February 16th. It is 531. Over to you, Planning Director, for your update. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I don't have any significant updates for the time being. Uh, I do expect to have a public hearing uh, with you all. I believe we have a, uh, a March 8th, or excuse me, uh, March 1st meeting coming up uh, that will include the TSP. Kevin will be providing some, uh, some updates on that. Uh, then in April, we also have a, uh, I believe April 5th, we're gonna see uh, some quasi-judicial work come in. So okay. condition, conditional use approval uh, request uh, that we will present. So a week so ahead- So on the first then we just have TSP, nothing else? Nothing, uh, nothing planned. Uh, okay. We have that scheduled possibly for, uh, for two meetings as well. Uh, right okay. Off. And then the 15th, was that when you were out? No, uh, I think TSP on that as well. Okay. So the first and the 15th could be TSP and then the fifth will do quasi judicial. Yep. Okay. And other than that, we, other than minutes, we just have uh, one matter on uh, for tonight, which is uh, missing middle housing. All right, any questions? Let's move on to that then. And I think we have one caller in, uh, in the panel. Yep. I, I see Greg Crafts and Nancy Roach on the caller panel. Oh, uh, I was thinking about the, our, in our panelist, on the board right now. I don't know who, if somebody, somebody else called in. Oh, the 503. Yeah. 310 number. Who's that? This is Erica. I just called in. All, All right. right. Thank you. Hey, Erica. Thank you. Thanks for that. Yeah. That just helps. Sorry, I had to figure um, out how to unmute from the phone. <laughs> uh, you're, you're in attendance. So that's a good, that's a, that's good to, that we have that on the record. Yes, I am here. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm interested in how we should run through the comments. Uh, so Dustin, you have updated uh, the middle housing code uh, based on our conversations. You've updated and, and highlighted some areas. Shall we, as we go through the document, as we go down through the document, shall we try and have uh, a conversation and gain agreement before we move down the document? Or do we want to run through the entire document and then deliberate at the end? I feel like we've tried different approaches and I'm not sure which works better, but it's, it's, it's been a bit of a challenge to get through the document and make sure that we've all had everybody weigh in. I'm open to suggestions. I'll make a comment. I feel like um, I feel like I organize my notes somewhat in the document flow order, and yeah. then when we go back to the end, we just kind of pass by some things that were maybe smaller details or stuff I wanted to discuss with each item because we don't really stick around there. So I might suggest that we tackle it section by section or page by page and discuss. Any other? comments others agree with that approach sure i'm good with that sounds good okay i think that's a thumbs up from everyone okay. all right let's take I that can approach. Begin the, i can begin the share of the document and we can yep. peruse through this and I, i'll i'll make some call outs where uh, I've had some, I made some changes to this last version based on your comments uh, at the February 1st meeting. Okay. Let me bring that up. Hopefully you see uh, one sheet. I do. Uh, yeah. This is the document itself. And then uh, I skipped, I, I skipped down to the, uh, the 
the section we've been talking about. So I, I don't feel like we've had any significant discussion um, up, up to the lead up of 17.25. Uh, there, there'll be some changes in here um, for definitions, um, included in this section is now a definition and base that's your request, um, including the previous, this is the methodology of building height uh, for the whole city. This is now an included uh, item. Uh, old building height definition uh, has been struck. Can I stop you on that? So yeah. I think what we had decided, what we had discussed rather um, last time was mm -hmm. we will keep the height at 28 feet because that's what the rest of the city allows. But I wasn't quite sure that um, I had bought into the idea of in this missing middle code, we had talked about a new building height calculation tool. And I think what we were bouncing around was this idea of, you know, should we just let the missing middle housing be the same as the city? which means that we are beholden to some building height code that isn't optimal and can be misinterpreted or, or, or what's the word? <laughs> and so right now, um, you know, you had put in some diagrams that actually brought us into a better place of saying, this is what a 28 foot building should allow. Um, now that we've, on back to the broader city's view, we've also taken away that restriction. Does, does that make sense to everybody? You, are you following? Yeah, you... I, I left there with the, the, and I was kind of the one I think you drove a little bit of a commentary on this. My thinking is that I've had on the top of my agenda for a long time that we actually just go in and fix the city's building height measurement standard. Mm -hmm and definition, yeah. and I said, let's just stick that thing on our agenda as quickly as possible and not have to deal with two separate things and figure it out once and for all and keep it in one place versus having it here. Then we change the city, then we got to go back and change this. I mean, I just feel like, I feel like it's going to be confusing for everybody if we have two different definitions, depending on what you're doing. So I think yeah, that was how it ended up this way. What would be the risks here, Dustin? If we leave this, we, we could just have a rash of, <laughs> until we change the city, you know, there's a, there's a chance that um, 28 feet isn't 28 feet for this middle missing. Yeah, the, uh, the change here reflects just the, um, the re-adoption of the basic building height from the rest of the city. Yeah. So rather than using a post development uh, methodology and the 25 foot measure to the ridge, this goes back to pre-development grade and possibilities of um, where we have slope sites of, of three story plus. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the, that's, that's, that's the significance of, of keeping it from where it was to where it is now. But if we try to get this on the agenda, what, what, what does that look like? We wanted to get the, fixing of the building code citywide for the height on the agenda. Um, how soon could we do that? Uh, probably not soon because I'm going to move on to, well, what we will have is an audit this year uh, in the work plan and legislative, we're going to have an audit of the entire code, which will include that. Uh, we're, we're not, I don't have a plan or a project that's queued up to uh, dial into building height alone as a standalone code amendment, legislative change. Could, I thought we, in our prioritization, I thought we like as the commission, we called that out as one of our top priorities. I thought that, that was, was that was in there. Uh, that didn't make the uh, the project list for the year. It, and it got rolled into a greater code conversation. So what did make it is a reevaluation of zoning code and what would it take to overhaul it? Okay rather than a, a, a narrower fix. So I guess there, so let me ask one other question before we decide what to do here. So what's the risk if we don't, what, what's the risk if we just take 
building height definition out right here and just say reference city code section XYZ. That way, if we update that, we update that. So the, so the two options would be leave the detail in that you had or two, fall back to the city code. And when that changes, this is corrected. Yeah, there's really it, it, very little. I mean, if we we're going to, there's, there's very little substantive change. If, if we take this definition out or and refer to city code, this is essentially referring to city code. So the only risk would be if we went back and did a code cleanup and missed it, then we missed it. We, I've looked at our code for like 30 years and we said we were never going to miss a code cleanup and that, and we can't. <laughs> so I'm all for sticking stuff in one place. And I would say the same about the floor area ratio definition, defining it in two places in this code set. Let's just keep it at one. But that, that's, that would be my opinion is that we just leave it at that. So, but that's, um, um, that, that's one of many. So, <laughs> should be yeah, I think the, so, so then the issue would be is if we just refer to the city code that, that basically, um, it'll be open season <laughs> to use the existing rules, uh, until we get around to modifying the city code and we don't know when it is. But, the, but this matches city code, right? So, I mean, to Bill's point, if we just take this out and say reference city code, it's going to say what we've got here, right? Yeah, I think the yeah. issue is just that there's some in, in the city code based on the pre existing slope um, and slope side to pre existing grade. We are ending up with product that's three stories tall, 38 right. feet tall, right? That's what we were trying to avoid with missing middle housing. Mm hmm at the densities that we're talking about. That's the challenge. Other thoughts from others? So at, at this point, I mean, striking it would basically be with with no reinsertion would be basically mean using the city code mm -hmm. leaving it it is the city code so i think it's in terms of significance it's just not located in two places so. yeah when we did part of the city municipal code updates we apportioned some of those pieces and sent them to council in advance of the other pieces that we delayed. Um, are those now implemented in city code or are they still in limbo? And this building height, if it's something that we want to do soon, could it be apportioned out of the rest of the conversation and fast tracked to city council? Um, the other pieces uh, did get codified. So um, we remember we started off with ADU, that's a part of the code, floor right. and mm -hmm. coverage, uh, that's included in the code. Um, land divisions included in the code. Uh, so there's a, there's a series of them that are codified and active now. So why couldn't we do that with the building height one then? Uh, track it through. Bandwidth and, and what's queued up for projects ahead of time. Yeah. So I'm going to end up focusing our bandwidth on the entire code and the project list that came out of council for 2021. I mean, given that I'm more inclined just to put it in here, um, put in the change, put in, put the section K back into the description here and uh, keep missing middle Uh, you know, to this this new diagram. Anyone else part of this conversation? Um. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree with you, Mark. Um, given what, I guess, what could happen without leaving it in here, um, I, I, I'm, I would rather leave it in, I think, even though it means that when we do change it, we have two places to change it. But I also agree with Bill that the ultimate goal is to get it in one place only. 
and not separated. Yeah, I mean, when it, when the when the rest of the code is codified, can we not come yeah. back in here and clean this up and get rid of the duplication? Or just take it out. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, if if it was something that we or it would stay the same, saying this is a product type that we want to have a different measurement. Mm -hmm. I mean, there would be a there would be a, a choice there whether the yeah. baseline or underlying code is. I mean, there's a policy decision there of to change it and whether what parts do we want to change. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be some some forks in that road. Um, on do we change it for everything? Is it good that we have a universal height for buildings? Uh, does it need to change by zone? Do we want to incentivize more height in certain zones? Do we want to, I mean, that, those are all policy choices that are going to need to be made before we make a code change. All right. Do we want to uh, take a vote on this now? Sure. I'm, All right. I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm in the, I mean, I think the two cases the state are, we put back in section K or we leave it with whatever city code we have at the time. Excellent. So the two choices are we, we go to the citywide code, which is, which is allows 28 feet based on the existing measurement methodology or we say we adopt a 28 feet height from the existing city code but we have a new height calculation methodology those are the two options on the table yeah i i think in your last discussion there was the uh, first one of the ideas was using the new methodology but upping it to 28 feet rather than 20 25 yeah. no i agree with that yeah yeah that, that was my option b Okay. Yeah. Well, I would I would vote for option B. Okay. How do others vote? Erica, I vote for option B as well. Okay. I vote for option B as well. Okay. Amy votes for option B. Megan. I'm confused. Can you review those? You bet. So. So we agree, like it, when we started the code, we were at 25 feet, which was unusual and specific to this building form. We decided that that wasn't something we wanted to have be different from the rest of the city. So we, we moved up to allowing the height at 28 feet. And so that matches the rest of the city. Yeah. So in both option A and B, we're at 28 feet tall. But we have a choice of whether to use the existing methodology for height calculation that's in the existing code or adopt a new diagram, section K, that is proposed. Uh, and section K is reimagined, you know, the way that we do the measurement is reimagined to take away some of the, the things that have happened where people are measuring from the existing site and we've ended up with uh, 38 feet tall buildings, homes. So it, uh, I guess the comment I'll have is if we go to K, yeah. we're going to have to dig into, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of components to K. There's how do you find the average grade and then how do you measure for a bunch of different diagrams? We have to look at ridge height, we have to look at parapets, we have to look at eaves, we have to look at all these min max dimensions for every type of roof configuration. It just is like, it seems like a lot of brain damage to me mm -hmm. that we're, we're, I'm not ready to, I haven't thought about right now. Um, and if we're gonna go this route, we have to, we have to put brain power to it. And I just figure, why wouldn't we do this with some background from other municipalities of best practices of how this works? Because I haven't, I don't know that I've seen these particular diagrams in any other municipalities. I guess my opinion is pointing to the regular city height, building height, and 
one day we will modify that, but with the overall idea of this document to um, to better enable the the developers to get middle housing done, I'm um, in a more uh, I I would just like it to be less confusing. So. I don't know what that option is. <laughs> is that A? Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Well, A is, yeah, A is not make a, a special case. Just follow right. the suit. That's what, that's what my, uh, I would prefer not a special case. Mm -hmm. So it, in that situation, I just want to make sure I understand things as well. In that situation, we have the potential for a taller building because it's all based on how we measure this, right? Yeah, so on the, what you have in front of you, uh, two, this is the methodology for the existing code. Um, Hang on, you're not sharing anything if you're trying to share something. We just see the PDF. Oh, you're that's, on page, yeah. I, I think you're on page okay, there's the existing, 13. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is the exist, this is from okay. the existing code now inserted into. Um, gotcha. When middle. you end up with a slope site that has a grade change more than 10 feet, which in Hood River is, is not uncommon. Um, we end up with the scenario where um, we measure 10 feet from grade to the highest point of the building, or 10 feet from the lowest grade to the highest point of the building, which essentially can be a 38 foot elevation, a three story elevation. And that is, it's just what it is. Right? It's just, it, it results in a three story or more building. So, and that's been a challenge in some of the infill sites when it comes to third story living, uh, if we're gonna end up with no lot frontages, no lot coverages, uh, it can be tricky. It's gonna result in some significant, my, my concern is it's gonna result in some significant set asides for fire department that's gonna eat up usable area and it's gonna result in just larger buildings. Scale, it's, it ends up being a uh, more intense scale than the prescribed post-development grade, average grade look, um, and difference in building heights or building height calculations for pitched roofs, flat roofs, mm -hmm. roofs. It is, it's definitely more, it's more complicated. Uh, I wouldn't say it's more complicated, it's different. Administrative code, there's plenty of complications on what is pre-development grade <laughs> and what is the highest point, so. Amy? Yeah, so I'm assuming you guys have talked to builders or uh, where did you take that calculation from? Or where did you, where did you get that from? Uh, which calculation, which one? Just the, Sorry. The, the section K one of taking the average and then doing 28 feet from there. Um, uh, uh, is that, did that come from a different city? Is that come from stakeholder groups? Um, where did that come from? So the, the existing one is more similar to both Seattle and Portland's average grade. If you look, they'll shoot the corners of an existing, of a proposed building. So it's, it's more reminiscent of that, uh, that philosophy rather than 10 feet from the bottom. Uh, the, the change, the 28 feet, and I think that was item B, um, came from a, uh, our local building community who stated that if we stuck to 25, it would be difficult to fully utilize the second floor. So that's where some of that commentary came from. The idea of um, the philosophy is to, to shorten the building to a two-story building. Um, but they said if you went 25, not 28, um, your, the use of the second store would, story would be compromised. So if that makes sense. So a little bit, a little bit from everywhere. Do you want to... Do you want to I mean, for me, my challenge with this is I don't really want to put the brain power into actually dealing with this. And I feel like we need to deal with it because I start looking at your section K and I start looking at, oh, a parapet. Well, what is this going to be? How tall is this going to be? We haven't got comments from the building community. We rev this and we're now we're going to 28 feet. But what does that mean of, for roof pitch? What does that mean for max eave height? Um, and then we got to circulate that through the building community again and say, okay, guys, we just added three feet. Where do we add it? 
So that's, that's why I'm punting. I, I mean, I, I think I'm happy to have the conversation, but then I'm going to want to go into the weeds on it. That's my problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So for those of you who want to suggest that we do B, let's do it and go into the weeds. And let's see some examples from different cities and let's do this, that, and the other thing. So if we went with um, with A and kept it the way that it is, I think the priority would be is to, to squeeze this into a um, you know a near term a near term uh, hearing. How long is it going to take to get uh, missing middle through? Discussion once we're done with this document, right? We got to tee it up, take it through the city council. We could, we could jump on the building height separately. So, so maybe we should go look at K for a quick second. I mean, the average building height com- comment seems pretty straightforward. Add up four corners, divide by four, final grade. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that, that's not complicated to me. Right. Um, it's all the other stuff that's, uh, and I think some cities actually base your building height depending on if you're on the uphill or downhill side of a street, some things like that. Um, mm-hmm. I think that we would evolve our conversation maybe when we really dug into it. In the meantime, if we want to just do something, we do this average grade in 28 feet. The place where I'm getting a little off track is the three pictures. Um, pitched, shed, flat. Mm-hmm. Page 15. Do you want me to navigate? Yeah. To 15? Okay. Page 13 and then 15, yeah. Yeah. So page 14, take four corners, add them up, take the average. That sounds good so far. Building height calculation with a pitch roof, 25 max building height to the ridge height from this average grade. So there's the difference between a pitch and shed. Mm -hmm. The shed steps down even further. So basically what we're saying is, is we're okay with the notion of 18 feet to a, to a, to a gutter line, to an eave. 18 foot to an eave, and then we transfer that down to the pitch roof, and we uh, we say if you don't want to go up with the roof, you don't need to, you know, you can't take that eave any higher, because what we're trying to do is get to a two-story building, not a three. And then mentioning now this is flat flat roof. Can I ask, what is the issue with three-story buildings and flat roofs? For one purpose on the fire side, if you're going to end up with a three-story building, we're going to end up with a 26-foot wide access road or access drive so that mm-hmm. they can, it's referred to as an aerial apparatus drive. Uh, if we're looking at smaller infill sites, that just erodes the site. That's one issue. The second is when you have a flat roof building and you build to the setback, there's really no pitch. So you end up with a mass, a greater mass of the structure within that distance of the house, rather than a pitched roof that steps back. Um, That's where the benefit of the, in here, the calculation and benefit goes to a pitched roof house rather than roof house. So if you're against an elevation that is flat with a flat roof, and it's at the same height, it essentially becomes a more mass. It's a mass. The, there are concepts about averaging roof pitch, right? Yes, Dustin, have you seen that? Concepts about averaging roof Averaging roof, roof height? 
Uh, well, we have tear. Well, not in our code, but in you, some codes, have you seen an average root height where there's a peak and a you know a low and a high and a you pick the middle? Oh, you mean midpoint on a pitched roof? Oh, midpoint yeah, that, on a pitched roof or average roof height, whether it's shed or um, gable or flat or. Hmm. Oh yeah, there's. I mean, there's. I'm sure we could come up with any different methodology we saw fit. So that's, that's, most, that's most have you seen that one before? Have you seen one like that? In yeah, other I think things? most customary would be your midway pitch in the roof. That on a especially on a pitched roof site, rather than measuring to the ridge, you measure mid pitch. Uh, that becomes well, we don't do that, and that's why we see flat roofs. <clears throat> I mean, that's, that's the simple, that's the simple answer to that. So measuring mid pitch is, is, it's very, it's very available. It's, it's out there. It's just not the one that came because it can be a little trickier depending on what the pitch is. Highest point is pretty clear. Um, it's a little more rigid, but it's more predictable. So it seems to me that that kind of thing would just encourage flat roofs without the pitch, right? The average is the full height. In, well, if say the average was something like 25 feet, you would have a flat roof at 25 or you could have an average slope that varies between 22 and 28 or whatever the numbers are, right? So that that this is why I think we need to have the building height conversation and yeah we're not you know we're half we're half having it we're not prepared yeah for it. right that's right. why I was in the punt category common are flat roofs around here and I know where I grew up in Arizona and flat roofs are everywhere and typically you don't usually have flat roofs where there's lots of snow. Is that incorrect? Do I just, have I just not noticed that there are quite a bit of flat roofs around here? There's flat roofs and, and they will be designed to hold the snow. So I don't, there's not really any reason from a environmental safety structural problem. It will, it'll just be designed to, uh, to handle it. It's more the visual wall of, um, you know Structure. what this yeah. would look ne next to you, um, like that project we looked at on on Oak Street, right, where you you have houses on two sides with uh, pitch roofs, and then you have um, something that's built up to the height the height uh, limit of 28 feet all the way to the lot lines. Um, it just it ends up with a real imposing view. Um, Okay, well, I think then, I think it seems that the consensus here is to leave the measurement um, at 28 feet, leave the measurement, the methodology as is today, um, but let's look for a way to uh, have this deeper conversation uh, as soon as we can. Yeah, I agree with that. Okay, so I guess when I craft up a recommendation, it'll be something along the lines of uh, commission decided to stay with the existing building height with a yep. asterisk of please come back and revise everything. <laughs> to do with building height. Yeah, to do with building height. <laughs> yeah. Not my, everything. My, my comment would be oh. overhauling all of our code is a major project. Um, this is in my opinion, tactical. <laughs> uh, my, I'd love to go to council and say, let's, we're going to have to do it, you know, instead of having a hearing with 25 things on it, why don't we do the hearing for this one, um, get it out of the way, because we know we need to do it. Yeah. All right. Okay. That we, we did half a page two, three. All right, good. Uh, at this rate, we'll, we'll be done tomorrow. No, <laughs> it's an important one. So uh, this, this page will stay as is. Um, with the existing uh, building height reference. I have one other comment that, and unfortunately some of my comments are, uh, the, the big ones are come in the beginning. Uh, 
I had understood at our last meeting that we were going to maybe try and just delete the cottage cluster right. concept. And I saw it in here and I'm trying to get my brain around. I understand that it's in there from for some structural purpose, but I don't know that I'm, I, I, it's confusing. And I'm wondering if we actually need it. So could you, it, Sorry. The, way, the reason I understand that you have it in here, Dustin, is for anything that is more than four units, the only single thing that it does is it m moves their unit size down to 900 square feet. It's the only thing it does. Is that correct? It's only the footprint. It's only the footprint that's 900, not the overall building size. It's the idea of differentiating the cost. So before we had two units, um, configuration and then we had four which is where the cottage lived anything more than four was going to be a cottage development uh, when he introduced the quad it introduced a new building type where we could have four units in one building so it differentiates four units on on a single site as a cottage uh, it doesn't limit it only limits the footprint of each individual building to 900 not the overall size so let me ask a Another question, which is if you did a two story cottage that had a footprint of 900 square feet, would there be a floor area ratio maximum on it? A ma meaning a maximum square footage? Yes. All the, un all the units get capped at 1200, 1200 attached garage and 1500 with a, an attached garage. Okay, so really the only thing that that's doing here is capping the, uh, the footprint. I, I just, I don't, I don't know if we need it in here to do that because we already have that other limit. Do you, did you put brain power to that? Yeah, it's just differentiating the product types. So is it, if I have a, is it a single family home? And what differentiates a cottage from a single family home? It helps differentiate the two. It's just a small house, but it's a small house that can fall into this code set and be allowed some of the benefits or the sidebars that, that come under this, such as no, no minimum lot size, no frontage requirement, uh, extra right. land divisions. So it, it helps differentiate the two. So if we did four units, the units can be up to 1200 square feet. If we did five units, then they have to be 900 or less footprint, six units, 900 or less footprint, seven units, 900 or less footprint. Up to, if they're single family, if they're single family detached structures, over four, over four of them. So if you end up with more than four single family detached structures, they have the cottage footprint. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry, I think that probably goes back to this this page higher. I'm sorry, I wouldn't. Yeah, I yeah. I understand the concept, and I'm trying to figure out what would be what would happen if we just deleted it and fell back to the 1,200 requirement that we have for everything else. Because theoretically, this could even be bigger if you wanted it because it could be, or, or I guess it couldn't be. It's going to force your, it almost forces your cottages to possibly be two stories, which seems weird. Does that make sense? If we're or limiting detached. cottages to 900 square foot footprint and you want to do a thousand square foot cottage, you just need a two story cottage. So if you have two of them, they can be the main size. If you have three of them, they can be the main size. It's just once you get over four on a development, that's, that's the trigger. Right. So I'll go back to my comment. It seems, I, I don't know that it's intuitive to me that if you are increasing the units that we necessarily are, I think there's going to be a lot of other constraints to deal with to determine, um, 
configuration is just the fact that we went from four to five mean that we have to drive these things into two stories possibly. Yeah, I guess that's an option or a story and a half. I guess that was the intent though, is to allow that. They allow, they allow the, the story and a half to two story. I've been asking a lot of questions. Anyone else have questions? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Comments? I guess my comment is, is that, you know, um, the cottage cluster is an idea is out there. And if we could do something that allows people um, to build a cottage cluster that is smaller, uh, then I would, I'd like that. Whether you can achieve it without calling it a cottage cluster. So basically we're capped at four units. Is that, if I go to the, the maximum building chart. So where this actually is probably most impactful is in the R1 zone, where you have two units attached um, is the maximum. If you mm -hmm. want to do a, cl a cottage cluster development in the R1, you can end up with six dwelling units. These are the sidebars that go on them. So it's probably, it still has a place uh, in, especially in R1. The concept that it seems kind of at odds to me is that we're calculating floor area or total square footage in half the discussion, and then we're talking footprint in the other half the discussion. If we want to define something as a cottage, which is less than 800 or 900 square feet, then we define that as a concept, and then we use that concept in things like the max unit area ratio thing that says if it's a cottage, then you get a bonus density. That's, it just seems confusing the way it is. Because we do have a concept of something that's less than 800 square feet getting a bonus density, right? That was, yeah, that was in, um, in the side by side for, for once we get down to it, that if it was less mm -hmm. than 100, it would be measured at a different density. But that would, that is, that was before uh, FA floor area ratio came into the discussion using the area of the real estate to set the number of dwelling units that could be permitted on any individual lot. So I remember when this first came out, the cottage cluster concept was um, to encourage, it, it had open space and we, we kind of got rid of that. Um, it also, I thought, had a maximum of one and a half um, floors. It, it wasn't going to be two-story. And, and that, that there's a possibility of calculating an average footprint for the whole um, development as opposed to per unit. So you could have a, an average of 1,000 for the whole thing. So some could be 1,200, some could be 800. So all that kind of went away as, as we talked through this. So now what we have left in this cottage cluster configuration is like, it's defined by a, a footprint. And I hadn't really thought about what Bill just talked about. This is encouraging um, two-story cottages because it's, I mean, not that it has to be that, but it probably would encourage that. So it is hard to see the benefit of having this in there. Yeah, I mean, it can be struck. Uh, it, I'll sh in the R1, it's going to be the one, one area where it starts to take hold, is where in the R1, you have no more than two dwelling units other than the cottage. So you're two that, you know, you're not going to be, we didn't have a fourplex that was going to be allowed in R1. So now once you're getting into these smaller units, you don't really have a code that addresses if you wanted to do a series or a number of smaller, more than two smaller dwellings, unless you wanted to do multiple, what did you say? Well, you can do a PUD. 
right? Or and PUD, or without going that, to right? the PUD. Yep. Right. So we could do that for that situation. Well, I think, you know, Greg Kraft's letter, because I hadn't really thought about that as much either, the idea that a lot of R1 zones will will be 7,000 as opposed to 5,000, because I was picturing this in like in the 5,000 square foot lot. But when you get to 7,000 square feet, um, you, you do want to put in more units where you can. Because uh, he, he was saying at least have another ADU allowed or something. Uh, we don't want this limit of two. So I know in the minutes I, I voted as saying, let's have a limit of two units per R1 zone. But I'm wondering if that's what I want anymore because I didn't think about these big little lots. I thought I was thinking 5,000 square foot. And, um, so, then, so the other option is to kind of get rid of that minimum for the R1 or increase it or allow two units and an ADU or something. It, could I throw something out there, Dustin, and you sh shoot it full of holes? Um, what would happen if we defined a cottage right here instead of a cottage cluster and we define a cottage as something less than some particular square footage? And then we use that concept over in the other thing. What do you mean the other thing? In, in his table, which is oh. what's allowed. The max units, yeah. Is that? So, and, and you're, you're thinking a 900 or a thousand square feet, but that would be total far upstairs and down, that type of thing. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Um, so it'd be a, a story and a half or something like that. So I, I mean, uh, I, I, yeah, go ahead. So uh, we could define a cottage as, you know, for example, a, a single family detached unit of no more than X. You could put 1200, I mean, you could use the same floor area or floor areas for the rest of them with a, you know, floor area, no more than 1200 without a garage, no more than 15 with a detached garage or with an attached garage, excuse me. That feels, that feels so big. Yeah. If you're trying to fit five, five or six of these onto an R1 lot. That feels unbelievably huge. It, it, that doesn't feel like what a cottage cluster is trying to be. You know, most cottage clusters are like a thousand feet total for the building, if if that. Why can't it be scalable based on the square footage of the lot? Well, well I we, think we, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I think we had it scaled to the number of dwelling units based on the size of the lot, not based on the size of the cottage to the lot. So meaning a bigger lot could have more dwellings on it, not uh, having a larger lot resulted in a larger, something falls under cottage and then it becomes a, a two, ho two full-size houses on one lot rather than two, two cottages on a right. lot. Right. And I'm sorry, but where is the table? Oh, that's gonna be- Page seven. Yeah. So Dustin, do you think that what I propose is reasonable if we just figure out the right number? Yeah, it probably requires an, uh, something, some qualifier on, uh, within the code. I mean, if, it, if that's the definition, yeah, I would still need to have some, some sidebars on how, how does the cottage look. And I guess I'm, I'm trying to think that out. I mean that. So I'm looking at I'm looking at uh, Portland's code. I don't know if it's code or just something, but it says small, single level, detached unit, often on their own lots and sometimes clustered around a pocket or shared open space. Cottage is typically under 1,000 square feet in footprint. I mean, for for me. I like the idea of a cottage cluster as a one story or a one and a half story thousand square foot something. And that it, if you do that, you can get away with some density or some density bonus or something like that. That feels good to me, but to just use a floor area ratio or a lot coverage ratio and allow 
four or five 1500 square foot homes to be built on a you know an R1 or an R2 that feels like we're headed in the wrong direction in my mind. <laughs> I I agree with what you're saying Mark. I'm just trying to figure out how to make this reflect that. <laughs> yeah. That's why I'm that's why I was going back to the maybe this should be floor area and we should pick one and just define that as a cottage. Okay, so pick, so pick, maybe pick a, thousand, pick a thousand. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the number is, but Mhm. Mm yeah. So if you if you send a, a floor area, we have a definition of what floor area is right there. It would, you know, I guess an over under would, I could refine this as rather than configuration A. I guess I'm I'm suggesting adding this idea that it's a single level, although I'm I, I don't mind so much if it's one and a half story. It has a loft or something like that. So maybe we could look at how Portland has defined a cottage. Do we have some traction to just change this to floor area and pick the number a thousand and see what happens and move on to the next thing? So take out footprint and put in floor area? And pick, yes, and pick a thousand. I like that. And we could just we could delete we could delete the means of grouping of no fewer than. Um, we could just find cottage as something that is that. Mm -hmm. And we use cottage down in the chart below. Where if you're building a cottage, then you get this many cottages per something. Mm -hmm. right. okay. And a thousand, okay. as opposed to nine hundred. Yeah. Why? Uh, because that's what Portland says, because it feels like we're going from a footprint of a, of 900 to a full, a full building at a thousand, full home at a thousand. The footprint would allow for two stories. Two stories that, yes, it, and it, and they could be up to... 1200 or 1500 square feet if there is a garage. Yeah, which to me doesn't feel like a cottage. And so mm -hmm. we're talking about creating a special building type called a cottage that acknowledges that it's small, a thousand square feet. And then- And that's the maximum or the minimum? That's the maximum. Oh, okay. I would have said 900 or lower. Yeah, no, it's, um, so we're, we're saying, yeah. I know some two story, 800 square foot, you know, skinny two story um, cottage clusters in Bend that are, it's a great grouping um, mm -hmm. and they've managed to fit in like four or five of those on a lot. Um, and it's great uh, in terms of livability, having uh, a two-story building that's a uh, small square footage um, because it feels bigger. Yeah. Well. Mm. Yeah, if you, if you went to floor area, you just do flexibility, whether you wanted to do one story, two story, it just caps the unit size, whether regardless of, of its footprint. Right, yeah, I'm a favor of that. Mm -hmm. Which is also why you'd want it a little bit bigger than the 900, I think. It's capped at 1,000. Okay. Well, let's, if, again, if, if I would suggest if Portland <laughs> has figured out a way to describe a, a 1,000 square foot cottage, that let's take a look at that and not make Hood River different. So do you have four of you who agree to floor area, not less or no more than 1,000? I agree, agree with that. that. Yes. I agree. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I, I think agree. we're good on that. We'll All take right. my, my note taker. We'll uh, hopefully track that one. <laughs> okay. 
could, Hey, could we, I, I had one thing on the, this is in the weeds and hopefully not a big discussion item, but floor area, my, I had a concern with the state, the last sentence, it says a basement or attic space that is occupiable regardless of finish with a ceiling height of more than six, eight. So I, the regardless of finish is throwing me off a little bit and occupiable. So certainly in some attics, there's an area where um, you're outside of the building envelope <laughs> um, in the eve, you know, in, in the, in the pitch of a peak of a roof and it's over six, eight. So the regardless of finish parts throwing me off a little, what is, what were you so I took, in there? Uh, I took that straight from the building code when they calculate the number of stories. Uh, this would be either an attic that has a, a height over six to eight or a basement that is unfinished still counts to floor area. So you can't just have a unfinished space that all of a sudden is exempt. Uh, if Got it's over it. state, they count okay. it as a story. Uh, occupiable, does that necessarily mean that it's heated? <laughs> no. For, yeah, it, okay. So how, how do so I mean, you... I'm just wondering whether we're, uh, we were, what, how, have we defined, defined occupiable? Yeah, well, I mean, it would be an, an occupiable space. If it's less than six, eight, it can't be occupiable. Well, what happens if my attic has like a pull down ladder in it and it's six, eight above it? That's, I'm just trying to figure out, it's unfinished, who, it's not heated, we're going to deter, or I got a crawl space that it's on a slope lot that's taller than six, eight in one area of my crawl space. So that's where I'm a little hung up. I want to make sure we're clear on what we're counting. Yeah. If you have a, if it's over six, eight in the attic, we'd count it. If, if there's a basement that's over six, eight, we would count that as well. With a pull down ladder from the ceiling. But I can imagine, I'm thinking of a house I just saw recently where um, because of the slope, there's quite a bit of, <laughs> there's quite a bit of occupy, uh, there's quite a bit of headroom in the crawl space. That, but it's not finished and it's not occupiable because there's no insulation to the exterior wall underneath the main finished floor, right? So this i guess is trying to prevent somebody building it that way and then the moment it is built they they finish out the uh the basement finish out the attic then they end up with a lot more square footage um is what i'm that's how i read what this is trying to prevent well i mean how do how do we not just start measuring useless areas of in the peaks of attics and yeah, no, I live on a hill. I'm just trying to make sure that we're not going to be counting space that is n never going to be used. Yeah, this seems a little. Can we say like that it's outside the inside the building envelope or something, right? Well, it's all going to be inside the building envelope, I believe. Well, I guess it's inside the building, but it's yeah, it's not I mean, heated. It's not heated. Yeah. Yeah, he, the the insulation and the heat is it it's either it's either sealed or it's vented to the outdoors <laughs> in a crawl space or an attic, right? There's a difference. Yeah, I think the 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 issue becomes how easy and how quick that can be converted. I mean, a, a scissor truss or a prefab truss that allows an attic, it's it just differentiates. It's then no longer an attic. Then it's a story. I guess that's that's also part of it, and that's from the building code too. Um, and same with the basement. Once it's once it's bigger than a certain area, it's no longer a basement. It's a it's floor area. It's a story. Um, clarifying it or parsing it may be portions of the basement or attic with the ceiling height over that would be would be narrowing it. So if you have a pitched roof, only the portions over six, eight count. <laughs> yeah, it just seems like we're going to get a lot of flat roofs because people don't want to be counting <laughs> pitched roof areas. It, it seems like this is headed in the wrong direction. 
That that's what I'm thinking. Can we just yeah. can we just clarify this that it's unheated or something? Yeah, let me uh and I think we had climate controlled before. Occupiable space, I think, inferred climate controlled area. Yeah, sure. we can narrow that, I mean, that makes sense. If, if someone's got a inside their building envelope, they just didn't, you know, paint it or sheetrock it or something like that, but it's got heating and cooling and this, we should be counting it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can tell you there's houses in Sievercrop that don't have stairs to a full finished floor high finished basement that aren't, that don't have studs and roughed in that very well, you know, can constitute another six to 800 square feet when finished. So being able to differentiate that clearly and think for the sake of fairness, that is, we want to make sure that we're clear in the code on what, what is in and what is out. Okay, so I think we want to expand on the word occupiable to include something to do with heated conditions, space or something. Yeah. Okay. Climate controlled and occupiable. Yeah. Okay. All right. Are we done? Anything else on page three there? Bill, anyone else? I'm good. Uh, there was a request to add the definition of landscape. So this is a custom, custom definition. Uh, I think the key area is where do we measure it from the property lines in? And it's what, what, is, what is excluded from that? Your building is not landscape. Structures, parking, walkways, and decorative pavement are taken out. That's not landscape. And then a request for middle housing code, or what is middle housing is now included. Uh, differentiating full size, uh, full size duplex and a quad, essentially, you know, we're talking about a middle housing code. This is the, the sidebars. So uh, differentiating similar configurations. The idea of a cottage is a small house. Um, it's, it's not a full house. So helping mm -hmm. to expand on that idea. So we would probably just modify this to delete cluster and just put cottage in this list, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, nothing changed on this page other than I included definitions for mulch and non-living ground cover. We can talk about that when we get the landscape. Um, this section includes that, including the term zero scape, which is not a unique definition, but clearly something we need to differentiate between Xeric scape, which is uh, a water-wise landscaping philosophy. Zero scape is gravel and rock mulch. They are not the same. So that, that is included in definitions. Really didn't have a whole lot from uh, this section over the past mm -hmm. four meetings. Could, yeah. could we stop at E1 when you yep. get there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that was my next stop. Um, <clears throat> Planning Commission had asked for um, an amendment to this, including um, we had homeowners association the addition is other common ownership agreement uh, that will provide. So providing an opportunity to not require an HOA, uh, but putting in the provision for another, an other ownership agreement, generic term. Uh, could I recommend that we, cause in a lot of these configurations, there's nothing that would actually be owned in common. I'd like to change the word common ownership agreement to common maintenance agreement. Yeah, I, does that make sense? Yeah, makes sense. That's a good to me. point. Yeah. Okay, that's that's an easy enough change. If if that represents everyone's interest. Yeah, I agree that with that. Sounds good. Right. The only the only thing I, I mean I like what number one says there, but <clears throat> but the covenants conditions and restrictions. Um, is it okay that we continue to use that language? Even if it's if there is no HOA, so do you think covenants, covenants, instructions is the way that they would write up a common 
maintenance agreement using those terms? I think it's pretty generic. I mean, I think that that kind of covers anything that has a restriction or covenant yeah. you know, by binding or informal. I think that's just the catch all in term of art. I don't think it necessarily, if it's not entitled CCNRs, um, it defeats the, the purpose of the definition. It's, it seems reasonable to me that a um, common wall agreement or a common maintenance agreement would fall under that set of terms. Okay. All right. Good deal. Um, question. So sorry, go back up um, to number two. Would it make sense since we were talking about changing things to floor area, would it also make sense to refer to the total square foot area as floor area? Or is that, are we talking about different things? Oh, I think when we were talking about the floor area, um, I think we were initially talking about the total development. I think this one's referring to notice of an individual to an individual owner um, that they may not be allowed to increase the size of their dwelling. Individual, so individual future notice. Okay. You buy a 1,000 square foot cottage, that is what you buy, and that's how it stays. <laughs> okay. Uh, getting into the, the, the grittier details, um, the chart has been updated. And I think I can zoom in. Um, this this was actually cut off from the last time. Uh, it talks about the maximum number of, of dwellings uh, within the um, which with each individual dwelling site per building. So it used to be two and three. Now it adds uh, four units in all the zones per building, with the exception of R one. So two, two units per building within our yeah. one and four in the other two or three zones. I had two comments that were maybe general and I wasn't quite sure where to bring them up and they were related <clears throat> to some of Greg Kraft's comments mm -hmm. about the 4,500 versus uh, 4,500 house with an ADU and 2,500 square foot separate dwelling. But then I also was trying to just remember or have an opinion on how, are we talking about average size or maximum for these different things? And do we get into the configuration where maybe I've got a 1800 square foot house with an ADU in the basement and a ADU or a, a 400 square foot unit in my basement and a 400 square foot unit in my garage? So is your, maybe we should start with, for these size limits, um, are, they, uh, are, they are they a maximum per unit or is, it, or is there some averaging happening here? I think it's number of dwellings in a building, in a single building. Got it. But there's some spot, maybe it's further down where we're due to limitation stuff. Where, where's oh, the 1200, 1500? Oh yeah, for um, that's actually maximum unit to area that's in this chart as well. That's per development, you mean? The per line right above. Okay. Yep. yep. There's both uh, right above is units per development as well as units per area. That's all. That's all in this chart. Where's the twelve hundred maximum and then fifteen hundred with an attached garage section? Oh, that'll be in building size. That would be perfect. Okay. okay, well, maybe that's where I need to bring up my second comment. <laughs> uh, this sticks with the four units included. So the four units uh, or the quad yeah. is, is now in. Question on that. Uh, in regards to Heather Statton's email with the fourplex, it seems like we're still not 
getting to what she's recommending. What am I missing? Yeah, I don't know. Um, all right, I'll look up her comment letter and then see if I can better understand. Yeah, this, this in for the code now includes a quad. So within, so. Um, Is it only included if it's part of an existing renovation of an existing facility or is it allowed standalone now? Uh, yeah, this would be a standalone. The, the renovation of the existing facility is handled at the end separately. Okay. Uh, based on previous conversation, I'd also make a note that the cottage cluster configuration would, I'll, I'll take a look at that and make sure they reckon that's reconciled. Okay. Uh, no changes in this section uh, per our discussion. Lot coverage still remains, uh, frontage still remains as presented. Parking, uh, this is a council, or excuse me, a commission recommendation to go to 0.75. Uh, I had to put in a rounding uh, add on here mm -hmm. uh, because only in, when we get to divisions of four will we end up with even numbers. So we had to figure out yep. all, all the other configurations. What happens if you have one of those little cars they have in Japan? <laughs> Still full car. I'm just kidding. <laughs> You get a scoot, you get a scoot, a scooter bonus. Oh. You do bring up a good so, point that um, if uh, people have two uh, smart cars, they should be able to fit them in the same space as one gigantic truck. We're not telling people how to buy a car. Um, yeah, we we and one thing about our code is we don't. Um, we don't discriminate between tandem parking and non-tandem parking. Actually, yeah. in the codes, they won't count tandem parking. Uh, our code set from top to bottom does allow that. So if you ended up with the tandem scenario, you don't get credits for two spaces, but um, our, tandem, our tandems count full freight. Mm -hmm. And then I had a question on downtown. Is there anywhere in downtown that... Um, would benefit from this middle housing code? C1, there's some C1 um, develop uh, spaces downtown. Um, so that would be, uh, that's why it's included. So at the periphery of the downtown central business district, there's some C1 spaces. That, um, and that's why it got included in the code. Okay, and we don't have any appetite on the commission to excuse downtown from a parking minimum like uh ashland and to make a we, to make a, a minimum exception for downtown do we still i'll ask a question i don't know if i have an answer for you but uh, another question do we still have defined business districts heights in downtown yep Yes. And so they would be eligible for fee and lieu. Okay. So in the fee and lieu for residential, is it still 18,000 or some large number? 20,000? 3,000. 3, okay. 3,000 as it is now. <clears throat> so you're so, saying. So to, make it, so to be the contrary and to Megan's or to support Megan yeah. a little bit. Uh, if we're in one of those zones and they don't want to provide parking, they can just pay 3000 for the space. Is that a correct statement? That's a correct statement. Yeah, yeah, but that defeats affordable and or attainable housing that automatically increases the price tag of the development. I'm just looking at the Strong Towns map and uh, Ashland, Eugene, and um, 
I know we have some objections to using examples that don't exactly match exa what Hooda River is, even though I would say that every single town is unique. Um, but in terms of the Pacific Northwest, Colville, Washington, which I've never heard of, is very small. Um, Pasco, <laughs> Washington. These all, Yakima, these all have places that have zero parking requirements in their downtown area. Yeah, uh, downtown will, on multifamily will be 1.25 spaces based on the downtown parking study. So this already has a benefit over that. And if the fee and lieu is also- a lot, they have Yeah, the fee and lieu is a lot less than it used to be, yeah. So those two changes by itself make it easier. Yeah, we went from $20,000 last year to 3,000. Mm -hmm. so it's a significant reduction. Whether that stays that way, that's what it is now, so. Yeah, I would suggest keeping it where it is. I think uh, there should be some accommodation or notification. I think that will be a burden on the city um so i think we've already reduced the number down to 0.75 i'm i'm in support of leaving it at 0.75 and they can pay for the in, in lieu i mean i think if you're only building two spaces six grand is not going to or whatever the number is not going to make or break a project yeah um i would i did want to hit on number three which I thought we had just, you know, we went back and forth on this discussion about we want to avoid the everything mm -hmm. driveway on the front of the place, but also we didn't necessarily want to be having to drive around to the back of everything and eat up um, permeability and uh, green area. So I thought we had made the decision down in the infill or the redevelopment, but also in this section to allow 50% in the front yard setback. Yeah, the change is only made to the, I think it came up for um, existing space that's already permitted for conversion of a house. So that's the only space where I changed it was for existing uh -huh. home to be converted could allow uh, uh, the configuration as, as it is. The current and using the current code, it's one space would be can be allowed in the front yard. So that's where the la the language from the current code shows up in the conversion section. Right. It I didn't was, touch I anything was, here. I had understood we had at, we had discussed changing it in both places, but maybe we should revisit that conversation because I might have been incorrect. And so the argument for leaving it out of this location was this idea that we wanted to pull the houses towards the front of the lot onto and, and be engaged with the street um, as opposed to the houses hiding behind the cars, right? Dustin, that was the... Yeah, so we, we grandfathered in parking if it was an existing place, but if it was a new place, we wanted to do it right and quote, do it right. Um, but as Bill says you end up with driveways and a lot more driveway to get to the back. Which we're looking at the diagram right below on the top and you're like, where's, mm -hmm. the, where's, the, where's the yard? Because um, you just parked all the cars in the back. Um, okay, so how about we do an A or a B on this one? Mm -hmm. So those in favor of Allowing half of the parking. Is it half of the parking or one spot? What's the, what did we say? Code allows, current code allows one. One spot in the front. Which for a single dwelling unit is one out of two. I think that's where, but it, it specifically says one. I thought it said 50%, no? No, it, it says one. Okay. All right. So how would, I'm trying to think, 
Well, How does it the, work with 0.75 per unit? That's what I'm wondering. If we got six cottages and we got three spots or four spots, if I'm doing my math right, um, what do we want to see? What's reasonable? None? In the setback? Some in the setback? Not all four in the setback. I think we can all agree <laughs> with that. <laughs> I'm fine with some in the setback as long as it's in the back with alleyway access. I'm th I was talking about front yard setback. So, oh, front yeah, there, I think does everybody front want yard. none in the front yard setback? Yes. I think 50% of the total. So in your example, Bill, if it was four total parking spaces, two could be in the front. Yeah, that seems like a good compromise. Uh, uh, for the A or the B, I would be the vote. If, if A is none in the front yard setback and then B is up to 50% in the front yard setback, I would be a vote for B. Yeah, I think I'm a bit worried about six or eight cottages and all of a sudden we are, you know, we're back to uh, four houses across the front or something, four cars across the front of the, the lot. It feels like uh, we didn't end up with the city that we wanted, I think is my Question. issue. Oh, sorry. Amy? Um, so if you did put, so I guess going back to that, I guess I'm having a hard time visualizing that in my head as to what it would look like if you put 50% in the front. Would that mean that you'd have to create um, more drivers? Yeah, I mean, that would, you would need 20, at least 20 feet wide if you were to do, if you had four, say you required four spaces for your development. Two of them end up in the front yard. Uh, that's a 20 foot wide driveway. I think that's what would concern me just because at least from what I remember previous discussions, that's what we were trying to get away from. Is there a model where people have uh, parallel parking in the front? Some of our diagrams had like some parking down, like cars were parked parallel to the frontage up the up the side and in that case i think possibly using the first space in the front yard setback makes sense to me and that's kind of the that's the that's the point of i think when i'm trying to have this conversation oh we yeah dustin yeah i don't think any i definitely didn't put anything in the front yard that was pretty especially when it came to uh you know the building perimeter the site perimeter not the internal part that was that was less of an issue it was really more of holding the front yard for landscape space because now remember we're only landscaping the setbacks we're not doing site coverage that's the area that is that's the area landscape so that's the that's part of it and okay there's subsequent code in here that requires that prohibits the cars from being parked between the building and the public right of way as well So if you if, if we move down, we'll see that code appear appear again. Well, it seems like if we got an example of a corner lot or we have an example of an alley, those are both public right of ways, and at some point you're going to park cars between buildings and those. Yeah, there's an alley exception in this. What about a corner lot exception? Uh, the parking doesn't come between the building and the right of way in the perimeter setback. There's an exception to allow the driveway to go occur through it, but not the parking spaces themselves.
So I think Greg Kraft's letter indicated that if you required all parking to be in the back, that it limited the options in terms of the configurations you could put on a lot. Um, so my intention with allowing some in the frontage is just to enhance flexibility of of configuration and enc encourage more units to fit on. Yeah, I think I'm torn in that. Um, you know, I like the idea of what we're trying to do in terms of a livable, a livable, walkable neighborhood with engagement. Um, mm -hmm. I'm so, I'm, but I'm torn with that, and then I'm torn with the idea that you know this is a another unique cir circumstance. This one type of building type doesn't play with the rules as everybody else. I think the argument which led us to the first thing was to say that because, in looking at figure one there, figure ones and twos, because you're ending up with more dwellings, if you end up um, parking in the front, you are doing more curb cuts. And what we were trying to also do here is right. recognize that we've got more units on the <laughs> site that could lead to lots of curb cuts, lots of driveways, lots of, um, you know, you wouldn't be able to use the street to park on regularly. And, um, you know, you just see a bunch of cars and driveways and that's what we were trying to avoid. So I think I'm, I'm not that much in favor of parking on the front. I, 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 I can see it in the existing situation because it's grandfathered in, but you know, from my perspective, we're trying to um, recognize that with so many units facing the street, we don't want these mini, mini houses all having their own car in the front because they could choose to do that, right? There's, well, the max, what are we saying here? 50%. Maximum 50%. So it looks like they're going to have to create some mechanism of parking at the back anyway. So when on streets like, um, like A, B, and C, for example, that will never, I don't know if they're ever intended to have sidewalks or if they will ever have sidewalks. What, what is the problem with letting a developer put in two parallel parked spots that are right next to the street. It accomplishes two things. One is it significantly reduces paving. Uh, two, it gets the car off the street in three, sorry, three things. It doesn't allow another car to park next to that. So the cars get off the street and they can't park on the street. If you, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So it makes the people like I, I have uh, family friends that don't want cars parked on the street because they want more, uh, they want their children to be able to walk and bike on the street um, and not have to worry about parked cars um, obscuring vision. So, you're, so it, I think you're talking perpendicular parking. No, parallel. <laughs> Parallel to the frontage, yeah. Yeah, like traditional parallel parking. It looks like a regular street, but it's been extended. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah the, just... the, current the current code wouldn't allow uh, parallel parking in the front yard adjacent to the street. Uh, a, B, and C would all be local street sections, so the intent would be they all would eventually have some sort of storm system, some sort of sidewalk system that went in place. So. Though they are not compliant now, uh, they don't have a special street um, configuration. So the issue with if we got parallel in the front yard would be, uh, it'd be essentially unlimited curb cut, uh, no opportunity for sidewalk, no opportunity for street trees or storm sewer uh, in those mm -hmm. those configurations. The, the be, concept that I was kind of trying to push was perpendicular parking in the setback, whether it be front or side for a corner lot. I mean, imagine in like a f six cottage cluster and you stick two off of one street and two off of the other, and those four serve your whole development and you're not infilling cars into the living space. 
Yeah, I guess in, in that instance, when it was first introduced, that's our, now we've lost all our on-street parking. So now we have private parking that goes head in. We've chopped up the sidewalk. There's no street trees and there's no on-street parking for the public. That's the, we'll give nod to Arthur and his uh, net zero, net zero minus proposition. Well, two car, I mean, it's a two for one, right? Uh, you know. it's not just the matter of the width of the street. You also, we don't, we can't just give them 10 feet of exit. It also flares. So our, our driveways end up getting bigger than, than just the lane width itself. Okay. So what's the proposal here? Do we want to do a straw man again of a uh, straw person of who is looking to, uh, is it um, one space max? Is it 50% of the parking requirements straight off the street? Or is it uh, third option, uh, no parking? Where is it written right now? Nothing occurs on the setbacks. Nothing occurs on the setbacks. Nothing occurs between the building and the public right away. Mm -hmm. And this is this is all setbacks. So you can't park in the side yard. You can't park in the front yard. Mm -hmm. You can park except for an alley, which we expect probably some head in um, in the alley configuration. Okay, so three options: A, B, and C. A is one space, B is 50%, C is no parking and setbacks. How does everybody vote on that? One space, is this the same as the existing building grandfathered in, 50%? Yeah. That is, uh, we, could, we could wait till the existing, that is, you know, that's, yeah. that's handled separately. To be discussed later, yes. I, I guess the concept that I'm kind of thinking of, I'm trying to think of cottage communities and I go over to Wire's End and all the parking's like right there and then you walk down this green and all the cottages are around it. And it seems like getting the parking closer to the street for me is better. And I understand the curb cut argument. We don't necessarily want to have an infinite curb cut. Uh, so I'm kind of wondering if we had some concept of 50%, but limit the curb cut. Yep, I'm right there with you. Mm -hmm. The worst, uh, worst case scenario is 50% parking in front. You still create a really long driveway to get to the back and you have two cars in back and that's like, the worst of both worlds. Like, mm -hmm. uh, um, I'd rather take up the curb so people can't park on the street and um, preserve the land for um, uh, communal space or uh, open space. So I think there should be an incentive to um, grouping the parking around the street or the alley. Yeah, I feel more comfortable if it's an alley than the street. Um, so, Megan, you're saying all of the parking should be that way then and not have any in the back. Is that, do I understand that right? All um, of the parking should be encouraged to be in front so that you can have an open Yes, I don't want a hybrid where you can have some front and some back. Yeah, because then that's more asphalt. <clears throat> right. Okay, so I think I'm hearing Megan and uh, Bill are talking about some way of allowing some portion of the parking be straight off the street, but uh, and not deep into the lot but somehow minimize 
the exposure on the main on the main road. Anybody else want to go with that? Sue, are you with that notion? I'm not clear. That's what I was trying to understand with from Megan if if she still wants to allow parking in the back. What what is your proposal, Megan? Parking only on on the setbacks, basically. Because you don't want you want to you don't want to have it in both places, right? Is that what you're saying? Because then you've got more pavement in the back. Right. Yeah, if you're gonna create if you're gonna create a driveway, you might as well do it all on the back. If you're not to save the driveway, right, I'd right, right. I don't so know. I think how. that's different than what you're saying, Bill. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out what I'm saying. I mean, I, yep. I, I'm, I'm, I was thinking like a couple of spaces of either head-in parking or parallel parking um, with a limited, say, maximum, do we have a maximum curb in our code right now, or maximum curb cut, Dustin? Isn't it okay. 22 feet or something? Yeah, there's a, there's one below here, uh, G1A on the same page. Your driveway approach not exceeding 14 feet. That's one lane, one passing lane. That's so, for the entire development, no matter what size it is. Right. So I'm, so I don't think if, I don't, I don't see the, I mean, so I'm still, I would be at the, let 50% be in the front yard setback or a max or a maximum of 50%, the, the lesser of 50% or two spaces or something in the setback, the front yard setback with the understanding that we're only going to have a, a cut of a curb cut of 14 feet. But if the other 50% is in the front setback, that's additional curb cuts, right? No. That's, that's not, that wasn't what, exactly what I was imagining. I'm thinking of the case where you pull in and you maybe have a space or two and a hammerhead to turn around and pull back out and it's your parking's clustered right there and one of those spaces happens to be in your setback you still have your you still have your sidewalk you still have your um plant planting strip because mm. all that stuff all that stuff doesn't happen in the setback right all that planting strip sidewalk right. and junks in the right away right So I, I would agree with that. If we could do, if we could still have this, um, the curb cut requirement, then I would go with the, you know, 50% parking allowed in the front. Or maybe it's one space in the development or something. Cause if you pull in and you're stacking your parking all in a row right there towards the front of the property and you have green space and cottages along the side or the back or around it, maybe you take advantage of that first spot when you pull in the driveway, first spot in the setback, and then you stack it right up there. Hmm. I agree yeah. with Sue with the 50% and the limitations on curb cuts. That's where I'm at. This is no perfect answer. <laughs> what about a maximum of 50% or two spaces? That way we don't have like four in a row in the front, taking up the whole frontage. Regardless of the number of units. Regardless of the number of units, it's going to be a maximum yeah. of. Yeah. So with this 15, so sorry, there's two spaces. You'll end up with two spaces plus this 14 feet um, curb cut, or is it 
either no, or, right? We to, can use two use spaces the, or a 14 foot cup, curb cut. No, you have to use the 14 foot driveway to get to your two spaces. That's okay. my understanding of the way I read this. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I could, I could get with that. Is that your understanding? Sure how, I'm way, not sure how that. Is that, sure. is that your understanding of how that would be interpreted, Dustin? If we were to say that? No. <laughs> oh. I think you if can't you fit two, two spaces have, into 14 feet. No, but I think Bill is referring to you. You have one curb cut allowed. It's maximum 14 feet. That would allow you to access two spaces in your front yard. Maximum two spaces in your front yard. In mm -hmm. the frontage. In the frontage of two units. Or whatever your yard area was for your development. So it's 14 feet plus 20 on each side. That's. Oh. No, that's not what I'm, that's not what I was <clears throat> understanding. That's not, 14 what feet. that's not what I was trying to say. Okay. <laughs> There's. So I'm so correct. I, I didn't understand. What I was trying to say is that we're we stick with the concept of there's one entrance, uh, there's one entrance per street frontage, and it's a maximum of 14 feet wide. However, you're allowed to put some parking in your setback, your front yard setback. Okay, so that curb cut would not go farther than 14 feet, but they can have flexibility where they put the parking spots. And it can be within that space. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. It couldn't, you couldn't park in the right of way. So you couldn't park in the middle of the sidewalk. Um, but it could be in the front yard setback. And I, I'm just thinking of a little picture where you pull in and park it, uh, park stacked parallel to the frontage like a t like a i can draw you a little picture <laughs> i'm i think i'm drawing the picture here yeah but yeah let's see it <laughs> uh yeah, yeah where, right. where, I, where i was thinking of um yeah i guess that 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 would get there i was oh, i was thinking of some other picture <laughs> But Mark, your picture is what I was thinking, what I was picturing. Well, I was also wondering whether it's a way to get to the back as well, but uh, um, okay, should we, um, my, I don't know. Here's my little quick, uh, here we go. So I'm envisioning that you have one driveway cut and then maybe there's two spaces and a way to back out and turn around and you've got mm -hmm. a lot of room left for cottages and green space and stuff like that versus having to drive these cars all the way to the back of the lot. Yeah. So what you're doing is you're basically sacrificing some front house frontage onto the street in that location, in that area. So you'd push mm -hmm. the development to the back and the, the the reason i'm advocating it is i think you'd have more um you'd have more green space overall yeah Under, i think and, and less and less and less paving mm -hmm. But I think you'd That's also different. have more flexibility. If you can park in the front and the back and you can split that somehow and still maintain a single curb cut, you've given the developer more flexibility in how they lay it all out. Yes. You could take my little picture and put two in the front and then take use the same driveway and go to the back. Or you could put all four in the back, yeah. Or you put all four just, in the back. So I guess my proposal, would, my proposal would be that we leave the driveway approach to be 14 feet per front per, 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 per frontage and then um, maybe one space in the setback. Because I saw your little picture which kind of splits them in at that point if you got two twenty eighteen feet 
deep spaces on either side of a 14 foot driveway, your entire yard front yard is part is cars. Mm -hmm. Mark's picture. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You're just staring at cars. So uh, maybe we just say we can only put one in the, in the setback and that would, that would give them a little bit of flexibility um, to do something different. I think the issue I'm seeing is just this idea that um, we're trying to engage the street and by doing that, we're, we're pushing the houses way back off the street. So Dustin, is, is there something that allows or disallows where the front of these residences are relative to the street or any other house type, townhouse? Yeah, I mean, it- R2? Everything now doesn't allow your garage setback everywhere is 20 feet, which is reflected in this code. Mm -hmm. Allows one space in the front yard. In the front yard, I mean that's that's mm -hmm. the current code is one one space one required space is allowed in the front yard, and the garage must be set back 20 feet, so it matches it matches that allowance. This is definitely a very intentional code piece that pushes the house forward. I mean, it's very, it's very prescriptive. So when in by way of flexibility, it's not flexible. It's very predictable. And it is different. I mean, nope. It, it will definitely make things, it, it will not allow the parking in the front. I mean, that's, that's pretty. So by way of flexibility, it's intentionally not flexible. Mm -hmm. So. So if, if you wanted a code that said no more than one space in the front yard, and this is all setbacks. So just so you know, this is, this is considers not inability to park in the side, um, mm -hmm. you know, and allowing one in the front setback would be pretty much going back to, it's pretty much what your current baseline code is, allowing one in the front. But our, our current code uh, allows a driveway width of 22, 24 feet. Nine, 19. That, our current code, that's a max at 19? Yep. Okay. Which is essentially accommodates two car driveway. I mean, that's your 19 right. feet. Right, so where I was trying to get was one car. Uh, I'm trying to go less than I'm trying to do less cars than we have now but something that's mm -hmm. where I was shooting for uh less well, than was, less than now is less than one <laughs> so but they're gonna make I'm gonna make more the dwelling units too I'm gonna make so the proposal or ideally um, I'll make the proposal and see A or B uh, okay if we stick with the 14 feet of maximum driveway approach, um, I would have, I would I would be a supporter of one of the requisite parking spaces could be in the front yard setback. That's okay. Option or option B is we option B is there is no parking allowed in the front yard setback. I'm in A. Even for a really large lot yeah we heard you yeah what's your you, in, you think it should be 50 percent erica well, I mean, that's why I, I i mean that's why i've preferred the 50 percent um yeah you know some of these lots might get large and to just have one spot in the front if you're looking at multiple if, if you, units on a larger yacht lot. yeah if you have if you have a hundred feet of frontage or something, I mean, it seems, yeah, it, yep. yeah I, I could be a supporter of 50, maybe, maybe we, maybe it needs to be limited by the amount of frontage because I didn't, I didn't love Mark's picture of two cars parked um, in the front yard. Yeah, tie it, tie it to frontage or lot size. Say one allowed unless you know you have a hundred feet or more of street frontage. 
Does the 14 feet per uh, that we're looking at in G1A here, is that 14 feet per per lot or the entire, like if there's four lots that are all built out at the same time, is it 14 feet for the entire development or is it per 50 foot wide? Per watch. So if you have, you driveways are scripted as one driveway per frontage for the entire development. Mm -hmm. So you end up with no, by way of the code, you're, never, you're not gonna end up with more than 12 units, even in your max for a single project. So that would be 12 units using one driveway. Mm -hmm. Intent of trying to make this compatible with an infill by way of design. Most homes don't have more than one driveway. So this is kind of taking some of the design cues from that. And again, if, and a, kind of that traditional neighborhood design of house first, house forward, mm -hmm. and street with your architecture. But that's why it's written none, so. Which the, 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 that the traditional, you know, pre car craftsman neighborhood design is in some cases different than what the modern cottage cluster layout is because in a lot of cases that parking is clustered somewhere and in some cases it's right in the front. And there's a bunch of green spice behind it. So it's, we're kind of, we're at odds with two different concepts. I think the cottage cluster went away. So. <laughs> well, but I think, you know, but okay. So it's the, we're at odds in that option. <laughs> option A is uh, keep the cars next to the street. Um, and option B is keep the uh, back, backyard green, right? So basic is that, right? So um, I'm struggling with this choice. <laughs> Uh, I like the idea of engaging the street with with houses, not cars. Uh, what do you think, Dustin, about some magical uh, formula that comes up with uh, the length of the the length of the street? How many fourteen feet we can we can deal with? Well, there's a access spacing requirement that's built in here. Um, you know, a local street that's 22 feet between them. Um, through, I'm trying to think about the idea of the development size is not going to be particularly big. So if you end up with something more, I'm almost, I feel like we're starting to tread into PUD land. Mm -hmm. if, if you're, and remember this, this needs to be very clear and objective. So mm -hmm. I think for the, you know, one of the encode intents is that we don't get into this discretionary, you know, so the mathematics is, mathematics are good when it comes to this. Um, mm -hmm. How do we move on here? Uh, well, maybe we just need to have a vote. Let, let me refine my proposal so that we have it out there. So, uh, 50, the, the parking can be in the setback for the lesser of 50% of the requirement or 50% of the frontage or some other number, 30% of the frontage or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So we don't get Mark's picture. <laughs> Forty percent of the frontage. You got a fifty so foot wait, wide but, lot. You got a fifty foot wide lot. Um, you got an eighteen foot parking space. What's that? What's that division? Thirty six percent. Got a hundred foot lot. Two eight two cars.
does that is there, that would be my proposal for one of the for my I'm revising my option. Mm -hmm. Up to fifty percent of the parking, a maximum of thirty six percent of the frontage. which would be less than what we have today. And you're saying um, this 50% uh, can be in the, in the setback? Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's option A and option B is uh, 14 foot curb cut parking um, out of the set back in the back of the uh, back of the lot. All right. So we go for a vote on option A or B. I mean, I think option A, I think we need to probably look at some more test fits for how that might look, but conceptually to investigate it. Are people in favor of the idea of uh, accommodating are you saying accommodating two or 50%? You're saying 50% of the vehicles in the setbacks. 50% of the parking requirement could be in the front yard setback and it could not exceed parking out mm. more than 36% of the frontage. Mm. The frontage, yeah. Okay, all in favor of that proposal. I'll vote for that one, but <laughs> I may be the only one. <laughs> okay. Bill, it's not, I, not that I'm not in favor of it. I'm just having a really hard time <laughs> with, with this parking issue. I, I can't believe how much time we're spending on this um, and not on the prior one, which would alleviate all of this. Mm-hmm. I just, I tend to take a more libertarian approach of letting the developer do whatever they want to. And on a street that is not gonna have a designated sidewalk anyway, who cares? Cause people are gonna be walking in the middle of the street anyway. So, and there's gonna be way more um, street action on a, on a narrow street that doesn't have sidewalks with people walking in the middle of it than there would, would be with a street that has sidewalks. Um, and, and lots of parking. So it's like Tina said, this is a conundrum. We like love our cars, but we don't want to see them. I don't get it. Other thoughts? Well, I, I think the idea of putting cars in the front, there were two, two reasons for that in the frontage for me. One was the idea of a uh, developer having flexibility, which Dustin kind of spoke to is like, that is not necessarily what we're after. We want something to have more prescribed. And I can see that. Um, and then we, we also got rid of the requirement for open space. Um, so we're not going to get put cars in the front and it's not going to encourage any more open space in the back necessarily. So um, that's kind of making, pushing me more towards just put them all in the back and at least have, you know, the house front approach on the street side for aesthetics. I mean, one of the things that I'm struggling with a little bit is that, um, you know, the reason we're going to the back is that we are getting to other um, other development, other homes in the back of the lot. And it feels like if we put parking in the front, we'll end up pushing more buildings into the back, into what is typically backyard type space and, and away from the street. You're not engaging the street and you're filling up, you know, the back of the lot. So I'm, I'm struggling with that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm inclined to, to kind of stick with what we have here in terms of one curb cut at 14 feet and stay away from the parking 
on the front, which is B, option B. So how do you vote? So uh, let's go through. We got one bill in the A camp. We got one mark in the B camp. How does everybody else feel? Erica is in the A camp. A. Get something close to the street. Megan? Amy? I guess I'll opt for A since. A. Yeah. OK. And. Sue, Amy? B. I'll go with B. Um, B as well. All right, we've got a split vote. Dustin, it's up to you. <laughs> the tie vote. Vote. You're the tie vote. voter. Why don't we I'm, just give both of those to council and they can, uh, we can have some comment on it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll take that as moving on. I can on. add that on there as split, kind of a split recommendation on this piece and requiring or allowing some parking in the front back. Yes. Or front yeah. setback. Okay, how are we feeling? We are two hours in. Um, what's left, Dustin? Uh, we have FAR. Mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty much. That's pretty much it. That's it on my on my list. Pretty much sounds like a trap. Um, well, that is that is all I have, other than the convert the conversion, which we kind of touched on already. Yeah. The conversion. What do you mean? The, uh, the allowance existing yeah yeah the uh, we touched on it um there was a change in the end of the code that allowed the conversion of an existing single family dwelling up to four units allow oh, yeah remain in place. okay that was your okay yeah all right so four area ratio we have a table That's around it. that do people feel um we have energy to tackle for area ratio discussion now This is the hard one. What page are we, are we on for like this nine one? Nine or ten, or are we talking another half an hour? <laughs> what page are, are we? Tell me what page we're on in the code. Uh, it's, it's not in the code. Uh, I provided you the residential infill project. Uh, Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And the okay. philosophy. This would known as the eight-page recommendation from Portland. Yes. Okay. So, uh, what a Hood River version would look like. Um, as comparables, if you wanted to, uh, I have that ready. If you wanted to get into that, got it. On your philosophy okay. and how you how took. How about this then? I, so I'm with Erica. I I think I think we could probably we could knock this out by eight o'clock. Um, yeah, I'm fine with that. I don't know why it's going to take a while. So yeah, so let's yeah. let's let's go with that. Uh, I am wondering about wondering about if anybody in the audience who's been patient wants to get a word in. Um, raise your hand. Uh, we're going to go. Why don't we go into um, looking at the um, the height? I'm sorry, the floor area ratio piece. Okay, let me. Uh, and while we look at that, um, if anybody from the audience, Heather, Molly. Nancy or Greg want to uh, interject, uh, please raise your hand, we'll promote you so that you can speak. Dustin, you wanna get us started here? Let me, uh, let me know if you see a PDF of Portland Infill. I see Portland Infill. So this is what I, I sent over from um, the Portland Infill project. Uh, this is in regards to their, the three zones that they picked for their infill project and the philosophy or the idea of starting with the base zone, uh, then looking at re taking a relook at your base zone uh, and providing a floor area for a single family home and then gradually uh, allowing that to escalate in terms of number of units. So uh, this is their philosophy, uh, much like Portland, our current uh, allowed FAR is not really based they are. It's based on setback height and building coverage. So they're pretty apples to apples in terms of Hood River there. We look at uh, building coverage. We take the height that essentially minus the allowed parking really kind of determines what our predictable 
somewhat predictable FAR is. Um, so I, I provided this to you. And again, I have a Hood River kind of estimated version of what um, kind of what it looks like with, for, for us. Did you send that out? No, I just drafted okay. it for, for your discussion as you, I, I sent this out. I didn't send out right. a version because I was just meddling with numbers and it's okay. Kind of back of the napkin look. Got it. Okay. Cause that's where I was confused. Cause I read this thing and you said our, our comparison and I didn't, I was confused yeah. because I didn't see anything to review. So I understood their concept. Mm -hmm. I think the one place that I have a question with our code, and I think it comes back to two things, like how do we allow a mix of unit sizes, like to Greg, Greg's point a little bit, if we want to do one house and an ADU, a big house and a little house or some stuff like that, how do we do that? Or let's say a house with two, two Portland allows a house with two ADUs, for example. Um, that our code set doesn't really contemplate something with something bigger than if you're doing two 400 square foot things, should you be allowed to go bigger than 1200 square foot on the other one? Um, where this concept just caps your total building area on a lot at X. So that's the one place where I'm a little have questions with our current proposal. And then the second uh, one with our current proposal is in my mind, this pretty clearly says if you're building, you know, if you're building five instead of, if you're building five things instead of four things, you get some benefit. And mm -hmm. I don't know how our code, I mean, it kind of does that, but I don't, I don't know that, I, mean, I guess maybe it does. So that's, those are my two questions with the different approaches. Yeah, with the current code, it allows more dwelling units if you do smaller dwelling units. I mean, that's the, that's the, the area, amount of area that it's required for a unit under 800 square feet or under is less. So it doesn't prevent you from mixing in if you had say 5,000 square feet to do one large unit and two, two smalls um, or to do three, you know, it, it, it essentially would allow as the site size changes to mix and match to fit your site. Um, the FAR concept is presented here is basically it's going to allow for on no matter what size site, it's just your building is going to scale down to the point where it doesn't actually work. I mean, that's, that's pretty much going to be the governor. What you look at in the FAR here is um, the current FAR is if you, they go to house, they actually strike the, F, the, the baseline FAR by 62% for a house. So they dial, they dial back in the areas that they're gonna allow this. The, house, the single family detached houses is now only 30% or 40% of what the base FAR is. So that's a big discount. Um, and then they start building it back up to the point where, you know, that if you, ever, if you look at the four plex on, on all these, the FAR is still less than the baseline house or the, the existing baseline code. We have not identified any areas where we're going to mandate or, or dial back the baseline zone. We've only added options onto it. So that's, that's one of the big differences between this philosophy is they didn't just take the baseline zone and build on top of it. They, they took the baseline zone, went to a single family home and cut it by 68%. And then they start building it back. Mm -hmm. Some of, some of the, the nuance in the uh, mathematics here. Um, I think we heard a little bit of concern early on that if we, if we were too restrictive on, on the middle housing code, people were just going to choose the full-size home or the full-size duplex. They're just going to go to that. Um, so we tried to narrow the gap between the two. Now, the concern would be if you go to your existing 30% lot coverage or 30 or 70% lot coverage and you allow 28 feet, three stories, your FAR is essentially up to 2.1. Um, and that can, be, that can be a tricky proposition when it comes to 
how do you dial that up or down? Yeah. But I, it's, it's an interesting philosophy of providing a bonus for the greater number of units. Um, it just can be tricky if you don't want to start with a, a major haircut for one, which is a port, the Portland infill. You can see that in place. Also, I'll, pretty much all our FARs already are, are greater than Portland. And I can show you how I estimated our FARs and kind of some high lows uh, if you want to take a look at that. Yeah, let's take a look at that. Yeah, let's look at that. I see Nancy has her hand raised. So while you pull that up, um, okay. can we get her to off mute? Talking permitted, Nancy, if you want to come yep. off mute. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you. So I will be brief. I really appreciate what you guys are doing tonight. This stuff is really hard. We lived up in Kirkland, Washington, which is close to Microsoft, and I was on the planning commission there in the 1990s, and we struggled as hard as you're struggling now with this. And I really appreciate your thoughtful consideration of all of Dustin's expertise and all the comments from people like us. Um, I have one comment to make about developers. You have some great builders who have given feedback on this stuff, like Greg, I'm biased there, but um, <laughs> Joe and Mike Kettler and people who care about the livability of the community. And um, just remember that developers are in it to make a profit. So when you think about what they can do with what you're considering, um, and Greg doesn't know I was going to say this. I didn't know I was going to say it. But um, there are people who will come in and max out everything they can and do things that you may not have considered. So that's where I would think, you know, Dustin's the one who has borne the brunt of people who come in and say, well, you said I can do this, so why can't I do this? And just I would pay attention to that expertise and the parking thing is going to kill you and everybody's going to be mad at you when you're done with this. I just can tell you that <laughs> you have, this is no win, but God love you. You guys are doing a really good job for our community. And in 20 years, no one will remember you, but everyone will thank you. And that's all. Thanks, Nancy. Okay. Dustin, you want to walk us through? Do uh, you get to see a, a, a um, hopefully a spreadsheet here? Yep. Okay, so I, I, I kind of try to follow the similar uh, layout to your Portland infill, looking at the idea of um, you know our minimum lot size in each of our zones, which they start with in Portland, uh, estimating what our current FAR is. Uh, that's based on your uh, maximum lot coverages multiplied times three. So that's where each of these come from. I, I went up here and I actually, um, I discounted that because you have to consider at least some level of parking that takes up your FAR when we start talking about lot coverage. So that needed to, that needed to be discounted a little. Um, you're never going to get, well, with required parking, you're never going to get your max FAR. You have to take some discount down. So I did that across the board. Um, using what your base coverage is now um, for each of your zones, 1.35 for, um, for your R1, 1.47 in R2, and 1.77 in R3 and C1. Um, so I took, I took that as the, base, as the base calculation. If we use the same discount, and I call it bonus, but if you use the same discount as a Portland infill model, that dials back to, um, to again, a 62% reduction right off the bat from the base FAR. So that would take it down to this uh, 0.65 number. Um, and then in R2 and R3, I, I moved them back up to the maxes. So where they would end up, they all end up, you know, around one or, or at 0.65. So my, my concern, I mean, one, one aspect of it is it certainly will take down the amount of building uh, permitted on each lot. That's, you know, the, the only thing that's going to cap it is going to be your unit size. So in those areas where you have four, four flat, 
um, or fourplex um, provided, that's gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna actually probably hit the ceiling before you hit the FAR uh, in those unit counts. So, um, and part of this also becomes based on your minimum lot size, um, you know, which in this code, there's no minimum lot size that is calculated because we take, we take it by the entire development. So uh, there's some, you know, we can, we can work on the methodology of it. Um, but there, I think you end up actually, if you take the same infill philosophy for Portland infill, you end up really driving down, you drive down your, your FAR altogether on all, on all points, which when it comes to scalability and, um, and kind of compatibility, that's definitely a move in the right, in, in the, in the scalability direction, you reduce the amount of, of, of building product that can occur. Uh, when it comes to marketed competitiveness, uh, it takes a pretty big, take, takes a pretty big bite out of the floor area that you're going to end up being able to produce on these sites. Do you know what the rationale was from Portland to start out with that reduction of that size? Because um, you just copied Portland at 62% there. Where's that number coming from? Scrape off and big houses going in. So the, the first is the infill that they were seeing in Portland um, was, you know, the market driven infill was seeing mm. big single family homes going in. Yeah, they really want to cut that back. Okay. And it was, and that's where the, the philosophy for this infill started coming in is how do we, how do we in, both encourage a greater number of units, but also cap the ceiling on, on how much can be built there. So they, they changed this, they changed the FAR, they started measuring 30 feet from the low side rather than the high side. And uh, they started really kind of turning all those dials um, to, to, reduce, to reduce the overall scale of development, but produce, incentivize the production of more dwelling units. Yeah. So this is where, I mean, if you this, look at- um, If they had a single family home <clears throat> lot and they had that big house and they scrape it off, what are the choices? They could build a regular size home or they could do an infill project of a smaller size. Is there a no, tax they benefit? No. They, don't get a cho they don't get a choice. If you went back with a single family home, the areas that are zoned now, and there's certain areas of the city that became flagged for this, there was, there's a maximum amount that you can go back. Oh, I see. So, so, so you are incented to do multiple. Yes. You are incented to do two or three or four units. Got it. Correct. But that's the adjustments on both ends that have occurred. They didn't, you know, we haven't uh, taken the approach where we're going to rein in what the, you know, the base development is. We've just added permissible options on the other side. We haven't, we yeah. haven't kind of done this. We're just working on one. We're working really on one edge where these things weren't permitted before how would you permit them? Mm -hmm. So that it gets, again, there, there is some nuance to the FAR bonus um, it, from the Portland perspective. Yeah. So that, that's where- for, yeah. for us using this methodology, the way you just spelled it out here, Dustin, would result in a, a higher probability of fewer units in some cases. Right. No, I think well, you would. A developer wouldn't touch the site unless they could, unless they built more. <laughs> they would build two or three units. Right. If you disincentivized the the single family so much uh -huh. by by basically taking it and cutting it by sixty eight percent, I would be very surprised if someone came in and built and, a single family. I mean, that's, that just be. Mm -hmm. And what's wrong with that? It's just a policy choice to reduce the base, the base zoning permissibility. Sorry, Megan, you're saying what's wrong with that in terms of ending up with a smaller unit or ending up wanting people to do more than one unit? So maybe I misunderstood, but this 
model here disincentivizes single family home creation? Not this, not what we're looking at now, but the Portland, we want to flip back to the Portland. Uh, oh, yeah. Model. So the point is in the Portland model, they took a single family home. I'll just make up a number could be 2000 square feet. Now you cannot build a 2000 square feet single family home. If it's going to be a single family or one building, one home, one residence on that lot, you can now only build 1,200 square feet, some number 60%, 40% less. Isn't that a, I thought that was a good thing. That's a great thing. If okay. you want to build affordable housing, if developers feel kind and they want to build one lot, one, one building. I mean, that would avoid the whole teardown thing where houses are being torn down to build something bigger. That's the point. Yep. Okay. For sure. Yeah, I don't think that's the, it's just not the approach that this was started on by, by taking what would be the buildable rights of the bottom or not the bottom, uh, the buildable rights of an existing base zone and reducing those. It was only thinking about adding additional options onto that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm not advocating that policy. That's just the, the direction that, that we took is not to reduce what is permitted as the base zone, but adding on yeah. other options. That was the philosophy. Dustin, could we go look at your code matrix uh, side by side thing that you sent? Because yeah. I think some of this with our thinking of cottage concept, I mean, we're the thing that I was hoping that we could get out of it is if you built smaller things, you can get more of them. And I think we have accomplished that, right? So if you building something that's under 800 square feet or whatever our cottage is, I mean, I, I would say we should revisit this table and have the concept of a cottage in there. So I um, uh, hope you see the table. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So with the, the draft that came um, within the, the, the R1 didn't change based on your suggestion. That was one dwelling at every 2,500, regardless of size. Um, so um, on a single family lot of, uh, or an R1 lot, you would end up with two permissible dwelling units, whether it's a, a single family dwelling of any size plus an ADU or two middle housing products that cap at 1500 square feet with the garage. Uh, in R2, we get a little more granular and then you end up with one dwelling for every 1250 square feet for those units that are 800 and less and then one dwelling per 1500 square feet if they're between 800 and 1000. So that's where your cottage would fall. If, if you, with a thousand square feet, it would be on the larger side of the, of the middle housing code. Whereas now you're basically, um, you know, the, the density mix now is one to 2,500. So you, you split that in two different tiers below that saying, if you went to a middle housing code, it's one to 1,500. If you went to the smaller end of the middle housing code, uh, it's one to 1,250. So that would be um, Bill, for your illustrative, one to 1250 would be like a Sager, a Sager density uh, on, excuse me, I think it's 7th Street was that um, at, at that rate. Joel's. Yes. One, Joel Knudsen, yeah. Correct. Okay. And that, and that carries suit into the R3, the same kind of uh, strata, um, of the of the smaller dwelling units one dwell if your dwelling units are under 800 square feet it's one to 1250 um 
if they're oh, if they're between 800 and 1200 then they're 1 to 1500 so let me we've kind of, we've, we've broken this down a little by incentivizing or allowing a greater number of units per air no we measure it per area not just far for the building well i guess that's my that's my question here so what what is 800 square feet measured by and the 8 to 1200 square feet measured by I was understanding that that was floor area. No. Yeah. So should we should we be saying floor area or all square footages in the table or refer refer to floor area or something? Yeah. Yeah, that I would I would interchange those. So square feet okay. it would be the floor measured 800 square feet in floor area. Just our font starts getting really small when we start and, yeah. I, and I use this just as tracking side by side, not necessarily mm -hmm. for the, I, I would take this and remove it for code purposes rather than the side by side. So my only question. Floor, floor area really means footprint here, not floor area of the building. Uh, not footprint, floor area. Floor area. Okay. This makes sense to me. The question I have is going back to the, uh, how do we, do we, are we, do we, do we allow anything, do we allow a mix and mix of big and small? And so that's my one question. And then the other one is how do we deal with Greg's weird split where we're 500 square feet short of doing something on an R1 lot? Those would be my two comments for discussion. So uh, for this, I, I think this is intended to allow uh, you would, if you wanted to do a mix of these, I think you would, you would add up your dwellings based on size and that would, that would determine your area. Or if you wanted to reverse out of the area, you could do, you know, you may be in a situation where you can do two, you know, two dwellings between 800 and 1200 and one dwelling 800 and less, depending on the, the area. So for example, um, if you had uh, 6,500 square feet, or excuse me, 7,500 square feet in an R1 zone, you could do three full-size units. Uh, in R2, if you ended up with, you know, uh, you could do two fit if you had a uh, 4,250 square foot lot by some shape, you could do two of the full size middle dwelling units and then a, a one under 800. That's how you would fit it in. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But you would need 4,500 square feet to do three of the larger middle dwelling units. But if you ended up with 4,200 or 4,250, you would end up with. You, you couldn't have three full size ones or middle size ones. You'd have two full size and one smaller if you wanted to, to do the max. Okay, that makes sense. So that I understand that. Then my only other question is back to the 7,000 square foot lot. And should we, we talked about this once and we said two, but Greg kind of is raising the point of mm -hmm. should, should we allow something different and Maybe we don't, we already debated it and we don't need to, but. Yep. For, uh, yeah, I think. <laughs> I think I know Mark's opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh. Well, I wrote this and, and I provided this to Greg too. Um, you know, when we started this discussion with city council, one of my asks to them was, um, this relates to House Bill 2001, you're not a mandatory adoption community. Mm -hmm. and, um, did you, so the ask was, did you want to consider the idea of allowing a duplex or two units in uh, in the R1 zone. Um, it's not required now, uh, probably within the five to seven years it would be. Uh, and the feedback that I received in some of the direction there was, well, we allow a single family home and an, uh, and an ADU today. Is there really that big of a jump from going from one single family home and an ADU to two middle housing cottages or two middle housing units? And, and that delta wasn't that big or it was an acceptable evaluation. It wasn't something that they, they wanted us to review that. So now moving from that 
to, well, what if we allow a duplex and an ADU? That's a, that's a little bigger, it's a little bigger jump than what we initially, or what I initially crafted for this uh, based on that feedback. I missed the, I believe I missed, I was driving, I missed the part of the planning commission discussion on the ADU, um, uh, nixing that. Um, and I should have gone back and looked at the minutes um, and reviewed them, but I didn't. What was the overall consensus on not allowing? It's just covered as a dwelling unit. We already deal accessory. With it. It's it, an ADU is 800 square feet or less, and we kind of cover that in the dwellings for 800 square feet or less. Okay. But it doesn't necessarily have to be accessory to anything. It can be a standalone 800 square feet. Whereas today, an ADU must be accessory to another product. This allows a similar structure of the same size to be, in its own right, a fee simple, purchasable sellable lot, sellable structure. And that was my rationale for how it got organized. Uh -huh. Do you want me to stop sharing this so you can go back to a full discussion? Just cue me when, when you well, want. Well, um, I'm trying to figure what we want to try and res resolve with this. So what you're saying is, is you have somewhat achieved what Portland has done without needing to use floor area. Well, you, you have floor areas in here, but without sort of the far conversation, we basically have the uh, idea of scaling built into this. Yeah, they just have, um, the difference would be they have an unlimited, really, un you could use an FAR on any site of any size to get, to get a scale. Um, we put a little more sidebars on this to use the area of the lot um, as, as part of the driver, as part of the, the determining factor. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they're limited their FAR would work for a four unit on any built on any lot until it got to the point where the structure itself just couldn't, just couldn't function. Uh, we've kind of done away with the minimum lot size itself and allowing projects to be built on a project by project or a larger project and unit basis. Um, but that's required. It, it kind of takes away from some of the FAR conversation. Mm -hmm. it, it makes it a little more complicated. No. And we haven't discounted anything for a single family home. You know, there's been no, there's been no Portland infill discount. That's, that's also part of the, again, what part of the philosophy of what, what they have chosen to do uh, and the approach that makes the FAR escalator probably a little more scalable mm -hmm. and palatable. I think what worries me a little bit about this chart, and, and it's hard to see it by looking at these numbers, but when you drew those pictures a few weeks ago, it um, what I was hoping the Portland table would do would be more about this concept of, as you add more units, the units get smaller, the overall footprint on the site is not um, as, severe, whereas here, when you add more dwellings, it's yet another dwelling at 2550 or uh, yet another dwelling at 2550 until you need to squeeze in that 800. You know what I mean? It's like there are these units that just keep piling in. Um, it feels a lot more dense, this, this uh, diagram. And I'm also concerned, by the way, so you have 30% lot coverage, right? We 30% lot coverage shown in, in R1 or an alternate of 40% and then in R2, 30% with alternate of 35. You know, going back to those diagrams you drew, 30% is basically your setbacks and the rest can be building. I think that's, 
pretty scary to me. Yeah, and that's why I introduced the alternates. If you wanted to to move move on that, um, yeah, essentially R1 and R2 uh, are basically your your landscape area. That 30% landscape is, is essentially the setback. Everything else becomes buildable or parkable. Mm-hmm. And if there was some, if you felt like that was too much and you wanted to mandate some internal landscaping or something, uh, that's where the alternate comes in. Mm-hmm. So it would add... For example, um, you know, in in R one, another seven hundred square feet of open space. Uh, in in the R two, it would add another uh, twenty five hundred or uh, two hundred fifty feet to to just about the size of a parking space. A little more on the inside, outside the setback. So. I think there was a little bit of sticker shock when, um, you know, in, in the R3 zone, the alternate or the, the landscape area is about the same. Um, when we were showing a 22% re- uh, possible open space or non-built area reduction in R1, that became a little bit, I think that felt a little significant. Mm-hmm. Or that was my read based upon your, your feedback. All right, we're at the top of the hour, and then some. Um, I'm, I'll comment. Yeah. I'm comfortable no. with the proposed alternate. Um, I building setback to setback to setback on some of these. I mean, I don't, I don't think we would ever have it um, because I'm trying to figure out how you would fit four units together and actually build something that would do that. But I, I'm okay with requiring some additional green space in some of those other zones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I'm in agreement with that. Yeah, I, I agree with that too. So recommendation would be to pick the alternates. Alternate, in- yeah. Okay. And then in terms of FAR to kind of our, I guess I'd call it area to unit ratio, having a graduated is is ex- still acceptable route? Yeah, I think it, I think it is. I just don't. If I look at, so what am I looking at? R two PC revisions. We're at twelve fifty in R two, with the so you're either twelve fifty, no, well fifteen hundred, twelve fifty, or eight hundred. Oh, sorry. Let me uh, let me slide this over a little bit. Um, well, but I'm looking at, I'm just looking at the, that white column R2 PC mm-hmm. revision. So we're at, I, I still feel like I want to see the number of, okay, what does that actually end, what does that end up looking like? What is, um, if you have a 5,000 square foot lot, you're going to end up with two 1250s and one 800. Yep. So that could be a duplex and what would appear to be an ADU type mm-hmm. building, um, which would be a standalone structure. Um, you could end up with three cottages. Um, and if you did four, you're probably going to be, can you do four 1250s? Uh, that would be four 800 square foot or less buildings. Okay. Four, I would call that on the, well, not necessarily micro scale. That would be four four cottages. Mm-hmm. And that's uh, only if this, the lot size is? 5,000. 5,000. You, you had, well, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. You, the likelihood of being able to have four freestanding buildings on one 5,000 square foot lot is pretty impossible. Mm-hmm. Um, you would end up having some sort of attached dwelling and, and or two two stack duplexes of something of that sort. There's just not enough real estate to get yeah. eight, seven five parking spaces, uh, building setbacks on there. It just it doesn't work. But what happens is if you end up with a six thousand square foot site, now you can end up with yeah four mm-hmm. four buildings, some parking. It just it it does have to scale a little bit. I think if you look at the minimum lot size, 
even three cottages is going to be a is going to be a challenge on that just because of you know we have the turnaround we have the rate um, mm -hmm. it just makes it it makes it mathematically possible um, add in topography and availability and utilities and it becomes you know yeah. it's mathematically available probably a pretty challenge to to fit those on there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have one question. It seems like we've we've gone into the weeds on this stuff. We've got some pretty good consensus on things. We have a code set that's somewhat evolved. Is this the point where we can hand it over to some people to test fit it? Is that our plan? Yeah, this is where I, I want to see, I was hoping for a recommendation to get it to council and see what, because I every time I test fit it, well, I could test fit it for, we, we started that in the beginning. Um, I, I kind of want to land on a recommendation. So when I pay for a test fit, I know what it is. <laughs> I, so, I, I mean, I, I would certainly like to see what the, these look like um, on a 5,000 foot lot or if it was an oversized lot, you know, how does this end up scaling is I think the issue that I see. Well, and that's kind of where we came from the prototypes. Mm -hmm. I mean, types that we started with um, you know that that was also with the that they fit into that that format yeah. but you end up with more attached products you know if you if you want to try to do more than three on five thousand they end up being attached dwellings I mean that's that's what yeah. it comes down to so that's where it becomes the triplex you know triplex or two attached and one detached that that's really what the configuration starts to look like mm -hmm. You need a motion so we can go home. Yeah. <laughs> or we're home, but shut off our Zoom. <laughs> uh, so you made a, we have a bunch of code changes that we talked about today, Dustin, right? Yep. Like revisions to what you've provided. And what do you think the timeline is in, next steps for doing something well i would craft them up as your recommendation because i feel like i got consensus on each individual piece or where there was an impasse i had that i would craft that up as a recommendation and provide it okay. to you and to council saying here's the planning commission's work on on the code okay and that you're you, you would present that to them at their next meeting it would be at their uh let me uh i believe it's march 8th next month that's probably three weeks march 8th meeting so i would i would need to have it produced before that it wouldn't just show up at that meeting so i, I would definitely send it i'd send it out the week before that Okay. So I could have that all crafted and I'd be happy to, to move that along uh, with the commentary. I would clean up the code based on where we landed. I would probably put some, um, some commentary boxes in there uh, based on, on this meeting. I'm going to have to definitely go back and re-listen re on where we, <laughs> where we landed on these, but uh, uh, I would share that with you as, as a, uh, what the re what kind of the consolidated recommendation and or impasse points were? Okay. If I can, if you're if you're all comfortable with that, that sounds good. Yeah, I'm good. Sounds with that. good by me. Yep. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, one last thing. Do we need a motion on this? I think. I, oh yeah. Please. Are we continuing or are we? What are we doing here? I guess that's. I would ask for one clarification as the note taker. Definitely. Um, you talked about um, being comfortable with the additional percentage for landscaping in the matrix. And it wasn't clear to me if you were talking about all zones or just R1 and R2. I think it was the alternates for R1 and R2, correct? R3 didn't have an alternate, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I think I was looking for a, rec a motion for recommendation to move, to move this. I feel like you guys have, have dialed it in. <laughs> I know where the gaps are and where I'm going to need a 
I guess, a, 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 someone to break the impasse of three to three. Yeah, so I guess the question I have is, uh, it seems like process-wise, it would be really nice to, before, I mean, so if this is going to be an ordinance, um, are we going to have another hearing on the final form of it? Yeah, there, well, I, I, council has to have a hearing on it. So yeah, it, I'm just wondering if we do. It's the ordinance, yes. Do we have another hearing on it or not? That's uh, my question for you. Oh, yeah. If you send it on as recommendation, Planning Commission would not have another hearing on it. Got it. Okay. Um, the place where I am a little, um, I'd say the, the, the lack of comfort for me in that particular point is I feel like it would be nice to have and maybe it's just we just give 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 up that but it'd be nice to have the building community take this code set and actually try and do something with it and see it that it has a positive outcome because i'd hate to I, we're, we're doing this a little bit in a vacuum and then we've we're getting some feedback from those guys but it'd be nice to actually take a couple lots and stick this on it and see what they would build and see if the economics of it all work before we say council we can put our stamp of approval on this. I don't know what other people's comments are. Anyone else? I think that's a good idea because it may delay the whole process at most a month, it sounds like. Is that the time frame with I'm thinking of? Is that realistic? Um, because I know the feedback that we've gotten from people I, I've really depend a lot on those developer comments we've gotten so far. So just confirmation of how this works would be great. Yes, I would rather them spend three months test fitting than us spend three months talking. What's what's your comment there, Dustin? Yeah, I I believe in the test fit. Um, I feel like we started with the test fit and we had some refinements based upon the, those developers feedback. So if we keep moving it around, I feel like we're, we're never going to, we're never going to get there. Uh, I don't think, I think we've had some issues raised by various people on what they needed to move. And I think we've, I feel like we've addressed most of them. Um, but at some point I think we just have to, we do have to go with it too. I mean, and go and see what works and what doesn't based on, based on some field. Uh, I don't think we've done it in a total vacuum. Uh, so I'm comfortable with the recommendation based on, I mean, I feel like I'm probably less comfortable with the predictability factor and probably all the wiggle room and flexibility we have. <laughs> so let's see, that's, that's on my end is how do I make sure that we don't, uh, we don't over flexible this and we don't have predictable outcome. Somebody's going to make something to work with this because I think the sidebars are so you know, they, it is such flexibility, you know, the, the, the landscape, the open space area being reduced to almost setbacks. We're back to building height. Pitch. We've allowed a density increase in a lot of ways. I don't see how you could not do something with it. I mean, so that's the, I think we've, we've given a lot of thought to those things. I think the, the parking area part is, is a challenge. And I think you faced it just as, <laughs> just as the development community will. Um, but I, I'm pretty comfortable, I'm pretty comfortable setting it up. And, and I have, once we got to a recommendation point, I definitely intended to do more test fits with it. I just can't keep having test fits and then we tweak it and then test fit again. I mean, and for the sake of our development community too, like we were kind of going to the well and requesting favors from them to help vet this. I, you know, as they continue to vet it and we keep tweaking it, 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 it is, yeah, I want to be sensitive to that too. To our volunteers, just like you, volunteers. So, mm -hmm. for volunteering your night. But I'm, I'm pretty comfortable. I'm pretty comfortable. It will, it will work. Um, I guess my I also believe in coming back to it. So. Yeah, my comment would be is I'd like to see. I think it would be useful for council to be able to make a decision on this if they have some economic information that goes along with it. So I'm comfortable making a recommendation to push this on, but I want a package to go to council that says, 
based on this code, developer XYZ over here could build something like this. This is what the cost of the units would be. This is what the cost of the land would be. This is what the sale price of the units would be here. My, uh, my only issue, and not to open up a can of worms at 821 at night, is that, you know, I wonder if, I'm not going to say any of this is economically viable, but, um, you know, I think we have this idea that we want to try and achieve some type of affordability. And I'm worried that, you know, we can't get there alone through the planning commission, right? We, there's no amount of um, numbers of doors that we're going to put on um, a 5,000 square foot site that's going to make it um, meet some level of affordability. And so by doing those test fits, you know, they might look at it and say, well, it doesn't pencil out, I, I, which is maybe good to know now, but from the city com, um, commission, city council, I mean, there's got to be some uh, ownership that they would take, right, in terms of taxes or fees or in lieu or this or that, right, that, that helps us get to where we want to get to. And so, you know, um, by asking the community, the developer the community to kind of beat this up, I worry the answer is going to be, it doesn't pencil out. <laughs> and then, and then, you know, we still need to go to council and say, you need to help. Yeah, I think I when one of the early things that we ask, and I think um, we've had some feedback on the development community, you know, and I think Bill mentioned anything's going to sell. I think that's, you know, that's the issue. It's just mm -hmm. making sure that, you know, in some ways not having such a big gap between between different products that we, that it, they never, the development community never embraces this or never takes an opportunity to do it, regardless of what it comes in at, because it, it's going to come in expensive. It's, it's only more affordable by way of size. It, it certainly, I wouldn't expect it to be affordable with a, with a capital A. This is going to be a market driven product. And I think we, we have to temper some expectations based on, based on that. This is going to be a market delivered product. So that is, you know, I wouldn't want to, to fool you into thinking otherwise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, it's not going to deliver us 80 to 120 AMI product <laughs> right. itself. Yes. Right, itself. Itself, yeah. in, in, it, without something else, it's, you know, I think we're under pretty clear expectation that um, code alone is not going to deliver this, an affordable housing product. It's going to have to be coupled with other things. Yeah. Okay. But okay. I, I'd be happy to craft it up and, and to send it back to you too for review. I think that's important um, based upon what I, what I would see as a recommendation. Okay. We don't necessarily have to have a hearing for that, um, but I, I definitely would want to make sure it reflected your. Okay. So you'll draft up a new version. You'll send it to us. We'll do that in advance of, I think I heard you say March 6th meeting. Uh, city council will be March 8th. So. For you. I would just send it. I would just send it back, as, as advisory. Yeah. And please flag it if it doesn't reflect your. That's. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that it reflect what came out of this and what we pulled out of the minutes. Okay. Okay. All right. Mr. Irving, do you want to make a sure motion? I'll make a motion that with the amendments to the code set discussed today that the, did, do we have a file number for this thing? That's 2020-37. That we uh, recommend uh, approval of the code set for file 2020-37 to city council. I second that. All right, we have a motion by Bill to Move this along with the changes as determined. We have a second, Megan. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Bill? Uh, well, I made the motion, so I don't think I Oh, <laughs> okay. Aye. I could say aye. <laughs> All right. Chair votes aye. Motion passes.
Uh, before we go, um, there's some meeting minutes from February 1st. Anybody want to make a motion to approve the meeting minutes? February make, 1st. I'll make the motion to approve the minutes from February 1st. All right, we have a motion from Megan to approve the minutes. Uh, do we have a second? Yeah, I'll second that. Sue is second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Bill? Chair votes aye. Motion passes. All right. I think we're good. Get ready for a TSP. Come right up. TSP on first time in uh, first weekend, first week in March. All right. It's thanks safe, for your safe March. Thanks for your attention. All right. Have a Thank good evening. Good night. Bye bye. Thank you.